Are you sure you know what you know? And if you don't, does it matter? It's time for another show from Colin Jones, the reasonable adventurer. Time for you to take another step towards creating your own opportunities for satisfaction. And it is a huge welcome to episode 111 of The Reasonable Adventurer. I've been having a lot of different conversations with a lot of different people over the last week or so. And the upshot of all of those conversations is that the old brain has sort of flicked into a different gear and started to sort of synthesize a whole range of conversations. And when I was thinking over the last couple of days, will I do it on, will I do the show on a particular topic I'd already nominated to myself? I thought, actually, Maybe we'll have some fun playing around with these uh, other ideas and let's just see uh, where that heads. So let me take you back a week uh, to a conversation I had with Peter Harrington. Many of you know Peter from SimVenture uh, in the UK and great business uh, simulation uh, product that that he has, which lots of students around the world uh, are lucky enough to engage with. Uh, Peter was wanting me to contribute uh, an international perspective to his new podcast show, uh, which is a really, really neat show. It's Startup Survival Podcast. So look that up, Peter Harrington's Startup Survival Podcast. <clears throat> and we had a quick chat about what that contribution might look like. And um, as I was thinking about what Peter might be looking for, I started thinking about some of the challenges. Um, and, and I suppose they're interesting challenges because I'm just walking away from entrepreneurship in a sense. I'm still going to think about it. I'm still going to write about it. Uh, but it's not something that I go to work on a day-to-day basis now and think, okay, <clears throat> what am I teaching to whom? I'm not in that world now. And I can step back and um, I suppose try to be objective, but... A subjective objective, uh, my view. Um, and I wanted to sort of bring in this notion of an inside perspective. I wanted to challenge you to think about what it actually is that you know. And how do you know that what you know matters? So let me go back to 2003, I think. <clears throat> I was at a conference in Ballarat, <clears throat> a small business conference. And David Birch, um, who's known to many people in the small business area in the late 70s, wrote a book where he named up uh, gazelles, fast growing organizations. And uh, he distinguished them, you know, their characteristics from, let's call them, normal growth firms. But it wasn't so much that theory which I found interesting. Um, You know, I was already aware of that work. It was his after-dinner speech, which I found really, really interesting. I was uh, three or four years out of having been an entrepreneur for 10 or so years, a dozen years. And I was just starting to find my way in academia. And I was still feeling comfortable, uncomfortable, as I <clears throat> tend to be now, about this notion of what is it that we study. Now, I, I, I don't, I really don't think that a lot of entrepreneurship research is focused on entrepreneurs. <clears throat> and I say that because the field is dominated by quantitative research, and the priority is to get those numbers up. We want to have a large N, a large number of cases that we can get some statistical analysis happening with. We don't want to talk to four or five people, no matter how interesting they might be. And as a result of that, we'll call anyone an entrepreneur. Anyone who's in business can be an entrepreneur. And yet, I don't want to digress too far on this, but you'll hopefully see where I'm coming from in a minute. <clears throat> when we look at 
Schumpeter's original definition of who an entrepreneur is, he made it very, very clear, crystal clear. The entrepreneur is somebody who's doing something different than the norms of the industry. Not someone who's doing something the same as everyone else. That person is a business person. And so you can move in and out of being entrepreneurial as determined by the extent to which what you're doing is challenging the norms, is innovative, is combining different ways of doing things. So when I was sitting at this dinner listening to David Birch talking about a problem he perceived in entrepreneurship research, the inside-outside metaphor. David also had been in business. And he was talking about one of the problems he saw, and it instantly resonated with me. And he asked how many people have in the audience have woke up in the middle of the night. So he's talking to entrepreneurship researchers, who largely most of who would be doing entrepreneurship education or small business education. And he asked how many of you have woken up in the middle of the night because you know you can't make the payroll the next day and you know what impact that's going to have on your employees' lives. Well, I've been there, and I've had those sleepless nights, and so straight away, I started to (laughs) have some sort of uh, flashbacks, which weren't pleasant, Um, but I looked around me, and people were smiling. People were like, what's he talking about? Oh, that's sort of a, where's where's he going with this? And I realized I was one of very, very few people in a room of, say, 200 who actually had come into academia having been an entrepreneur. And not somebody who ran a consultancy business for three months so they could say that they've been self-employed. Somebody who paid their mortgage for a dozen years, who financed their lifestyle, who grew a business, who employed people and did things in a highly innovative way. So, I found people essentially ignoring. So David was a respected speaker, so he wasn't going to be dismissed, but he was ignored. Because the narrative got in the way. The narrative got in the way. So, and it's stayed with me ever since. And I've made a few mistakes with it, this notion of the inside-outside perspective. Have you been inside that context to the extent that you actually understand it? Or are you always looking in from outside and trying to understand it, right? Now, that's not to say that you can't understand it from outside. But what I would suggest is that if you look at the research done in entrepreneurship, a lot of it's looking at bits of it. We don't want to look at it holistically because that would assume we actually understand it holistically. So we look at little tiny bits of it. Does an increase in social capital lead to an increase in performance? Well, I think anybody would know that it can't be just down to social capital. There's a million things at play in anyone's day and anyone's year that relate to overall performance. And that's why it's so convenient to leave the environment out. And if we do bring the environment in, we just assume it's the same for everybody, as opposed to as in every business. So this is very uh, inconvenient if you're looking at the world with an inside perspective where you have to embrace the complexity to survive. It's very convenient if you're from the outside and you really are just trying to make the numbers all stack up. So back to Peter, asked me to have this contribution. And I started making some notes, anticipating what he might have wanted to talk to me about. And as in what the problems are. What are the real challenges that are facing us? And I wrote down a little note and it said something along the lines of, maybe there's too many professors of entrepreneurship. People who understand more about what it takes to get promoted within the university system than actually what is entrepreneurship. They have, I believe, more often than not, what David Birch famously referred to as this outside view of entrepreneurship, not the inside view. So I wrote down a few questions, and I thought to myself, I wonder, I wonder, and obviously there'll be people in the audience listening today, and I'm not trying to offend anyone, I'm really 
you'll see where we kind of get to at the end, as in, do you know what you know and does it matter, right? That's where we're, that's what we're focused on. So I thought there's six questions that we could sort of throw into this mix. Have you ever had an idea, the development of which could threaten your livelihood? Have you ever stood before others seeking their funding on the basis of an actual value creation idea? Have you hired folks and then at some point been forced to sack them, but now you actually know them, you know their family's personal circumstances, and you know what the consequences of sacking them will be? Have you experienced those sleepless nights trying to work out how you're going to actually make the payroll when when revenues are just not flowing? Have you lost everything and had to find your way back and a means to be able to uh, move forward again? Now, I'm not saying that you have to experience all of these things to have action, to be able to study entrepreneurship or to be able to make sense of it. But if you haven't experienced any of those things and you are not using methods that allow you to sit eyeball to eyeball with someone who has and to feel their anguish and to feel their pain and to actually understand that process, then how do you get closer than an outside view of this field? So that has a lot of implications for the way we think about a lot of other things. So let's leave entrepreneurship alone for a minute and ask yourself, what assumptions or expectations do you actually have about whatever it is you're doing in your life today, right? What is it that you have? It's a lovely um, book written by Alderson back in 1957. It's one of my favorite books because it has an ecological view of marketing. And he's had a view, like me, he had a view um, that there's really not a lot of competition in the world. We compete against aspects of the environment, but more often than not, firms aren't going head to head. And he made this observation in 1957. He said, new firms enter a field because of an expectation of enjoying differential advantage. So not competitive advantage, a differential advantage, which is a very different thing. It doesn't require reference to any other firm. Their chances of survival depends on whether their expectations were realistic in the first place. So this is a big challenge for us all. When you develop your assumptions, when you move forward with a expectation of an outcome, Were the assumptions and therefore the expectations based on an outside view of that space that you're looking to operate in? Have they been informed by an inside view? Now, there's no doubt that my inside view has been tempered and challenged and further developed by me having the opportunity to engage in many of the processes that relate to an outside view. So this is not about an inside view being better than an outside view. It's about a balance between the two, right? But if there's no balance and you're dominant, if I'm only, I'm an entrepreneur and therefore I understand how the world works, no, I understand maybe how, hopefully how my world works, but I might not understand how everyone else's world works. If I have the outside view, I'm looking to generalise more often than not rather than try to understand the messiness of individual situations. So that doesn't always work. So, you know, a good way of thinking of this through is if you're working in certain fields, you can develop a theoretical approach to something that changes the way that other people do things. I would challenge most professors of entrepreneurship to name one way in which their research output has changed the behaviour of entrepreneurs. So it's good that we understand. It's good that we're trying to understand these things. 
But if we're trying to understand at the expense of incorporating all the messiness and individual individualization that exists around that space, then we're very unlikely to ever develop a theory that helps us to actually help the people we're studying. So back to my point. You've got expectations, you've formed assumptions. How have you developed them? Now, Lewin very famously back in 1935, I think it was, argued that the behaviour of people was a function of the interplay between those people and their environment. And therefore their development was dependent upon them being people, being able to improve their relationship with their environment, which of course assumes they understand their environment, right? That they actually can make sense of it. So bring that back to your own situation. Where you're looking to act, where you've got assumptions, where you've got an expectation of an outcome, how well do you understand that environment? Have you had the privilege of an inside view in that area? Is that influencing the way that you bring other ideas, maybe related to that outside view, to bear? Right? I'll give you another example. When I started teaching, you might find that um, you look at the top end of your students and you think, I must be doing a pretty good job because look at these guys. They're acing it. They're doing great. Well, I reckon it's pretty easy to teach basic stuff to smart folks. Right? I'm talking about the kids who have, when they were in grade one, it actually didn't challenge them significantly. It was interesting, it engaged them, but they cope with it and they move forward to the next level and so on and so on and so on. And then they found us in a university setting and they sort of said, yeah, okay, I, I think I'm pretty right with whatever you're going to give me. Just give it to me and I'll do my best. And they put their time and effort into it and they came out fine. Pretty easy to teach those people because they're already coping they're already doing quite well in that educational context. Not so easy to teach the people who really don't get it, right? Who struggle, right? So sometimes people have asked me, you seem to be an effective educator, you seem to be recognised as an effective educator, what would you put that down to? And much to their dismay, I tend to always give the same sort of answer, which is, I think I'm a pretty good teacher because I was really, really bad as a learner. And in fact, I'm still pretty ordinary as a learner. Oh, that couldn't be right because you've got this award and you've done this and you've done that. Therefore, but they missed a the point. None of that was easy. It's an unfolding process. I'm more than happy to have gone back and had a second dip at education and I'm only halfway through the process. Maybe if I'm lucky enough to live a long life, by the time I get to the other end, I'll say, I think I've got to the point where I'm pretty well educated. But I reckon I've got another 20 or 30 years of thinking about things before I actually feel like i am got a handle on certain things. But because of my struggles with learning, and they were significant struggles. I mean, grade one to grade 10, left school at 15 and failed pretty much every subject that I was um, required to attend. Because of that, I had an inside perspective in how hard it is to struggle. If you've never failed, continuously failed subjects, not because you couldn't care, not because you didn't turn up, because you just couldn't cope with what was sitting in front of you, then how do you understand how other people struggle? How do you come to that, right? So I think that definitely feeds into my effectiveness as an educator. I see it, right? The little movie, The Sixth Sense, and the little child says, I see dead people, right? Well, I see struggle. When I'm teaching, I see people who don't get it. It's like a mirror reflection for me 
when I look across the room and I can see someone, someone's face, what I think was on my face for those 10 years that I went to school up until age 15, that sort of faking it and hoping no one's going to ask me a question and can we move on, please? Now, my ability to exploit that inside view is getting better and better now because I've been able to tap into things like cognitive load theory and understand what hasn't been processed and what hasn't been committed to long-term memory and therefore what isn't being recalled on a regular basis when I'm learning. So again, the balance between an inside view and an outside view is really, really important. Okay? So, what is it that you think you know? And why do you think that matters? So I want you to reflect on that. The assumptions that you're developing. What are they based on? Is there a balance there between an inside view and an outside view? Is it dominated by an outside view? So you're assuming more. And we know my good friend Greg Brown always used to say, don't assume. It makes an ass out of you and me, which is quite always a neat little saying. Is it too laden by an inside view? So it's just your own expectations, your own understanding of a, your own experiences which are dominating the way you're viewing the world. Have you been able to find a balance between these two things? So there's something to reflect on. There's something to think through because I think it's episode five talking about um, the uneducated class. That challenge of being uneducated is always just around the corner for us right? I'm facing it every day, multiple times in my new job. Because there's so many things where I have to do something and I don't know the process. I don't know the systems. I don't know the right people, right? But I do know how to ask for help. And I do know how to keep another step happening to keep the process moving forward. And it might take me longer to get something done to start with, but we'll get there, right? So I'm able to remain educated in the context of my job because I'm not frozen by that inability to automatically do something. Good luck. I hope you enjoy reflecting on this challenge. Ask yourself, do a little audit. Where do you have the inside knowledge? Where are you primarily relying on outside knowledge? How does that cut across the spaces that you're trying to interact with? Have you been able to find a balance between your inside knowledge and your outside views, right? How has that worked for you? If you're trying to do something of importance and you can recognise that it's primarily an outside view that's dominating, how can you balance it out? Who else can you bring on? Who can you talk to? to try and have your own views balanced. Something to reflect on. Until next time, cheerio.